Okay, welcome to a lecture for UCSF Biomedical Imaging 201, Principles of MRI on RF Pulses, following the material in MRI, the basics, chapter three. Um, and uh, in a number of these lectures, I'll show some fun, or at least nice looking pictures, uh, that I found over the years of working in the field. This is, uh, I thought, just a very kind of beautiful image. This is a simulation of a RF coil profile uh, for a uh, realistic head uh, digital phantom. And, and uh, we're seeing here the different colors represent the different sensitivity of the RF coil. So. Uh, just uh, has a very, with the, with the rainbow color map, has a very nice look to it. Okay, enough distraction. Um, I'm going to start off by with this disclaimer. Um, the textbook or following MRI, the basics, um, their explanation of RF pulses uh, is done partially using quantum mechanics. Um, now there's actually, you do not need quantum mechanics to understand MRI or at least about 99% of it. We can maybe identify some small phenomenon that quantum mechanics are absolutely needed. There's a great discussion of that at this uh, link shown here. And so I would greatly prefer to use the classical mechanics explanation, which I think is a bit more clear and is gonna link up with the rest of the way that we're going to uh, examine the, the net magnetization and its effect on signal, uh, flip angle, and such. So that's what I'm going to use in this course, in this lecture. Um, so just be aware, I won't cover things in this case in the same way that, that they are, are uh, mentioned in the book. Um, and I'm going to add one other thing as well, uh, the block equation, uh, which uh, is the really the fundamental relationship that governs Almost all of MRI behavior, um, it's uh, it's not the derivations are not shown in the textbook, but these are the derivations that were used to derive all the RF pulse relationships, uh, the relaxation relationships. Um, it's really like a first principles uh, equation for uh, MRI. Okay, so here are the uh, learning goals uh, for this lecture. And again, we're centered around the RF, so that's related to the uh, resonance part of magnetic resonance imaging. Um, and it's related to our RF systems, our RF transmit coils, and our RF receive coils. Um, and this process is uh, the way that we both generate signal and receive signal. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start off the discussion of RF pulses showing this animation I showed in the previous lecture, lecture two. Um, it was starting to describe and generate some intuition as to how we receive signals in MRI. And what will happen is we get this resonance phenomenon where our net magnetization, the sum of our hydrogen atoms, is going to rotate around the direction of the main magnetic field and conventionally on Z. Um, and when we have a rotating uh, uh, magnet, basically, we, we create this creates an oscillating magnetic field. And an oscillating magnetic field can be uh, converted into an electric current through a loop of wire. Okay, so this is the basics picture of how we're going to do signal reception and our net magnetization is m here is our signal um, yet i also showed in the previous lecture that at equilibrium the net magnetization actually does not process so what we described there was that the subject will go into the magnet uh, they will the spins will become slightly preferentially aligned with b0 so we get this, what, uh, this slight uh, net magnetization um, from the slight preference, but it's pointed along the direction of B0. 
And so when B0 and the net magnetization are pointed together, the net magnetization is not going to rotate around it. It cannot. It's pointed the same direction. It's only when the net magnetization is deflected somewhat from the B0 field here, the magnetic field, will it begin to precess. So that's really the fundamental problem that uh, RF pulses are going to address. So how do, here's another way of illustrating that. How do we get to this point? Um, we're going to start with, you know, we want to have the net magnetization pointed away from the z-axis, from B0. We want it to persist so we can get signal, but at equilibrium, it's going to be aligned. And now the trick here is going to be to apply an RF pulse. So that's what's illustrated in this other animation over here. I'm going to start again. So this yellow vector here is now representing the magnetic field created by our RF coil. And it's going to create this RF pulse and actually enable us to move or tip the net magnetization away from the z-axis. OK, so a little preview here. So. This is another illust uh, illustration that I showed from this uh, DRCMR uh, website where they're illustrating both the individual spins here, the small arrows, as well as the net magnetization, the large arrow. And they're showing what the effect is when we apply uh, an RF uh, transmit to uh, to our system. So when you apply some RF energy into our system, it's causing these spins to tip away from their sort of nominal orientation that is now shown. And the way we do this tip is by putting a transmitting some energy through our RF transmit coils. And the, in the orange yellow here is representing the effect of this RF energy going into the subject uh, and rotating these vectors around. So the way we commonly describe this is through something called the RF pulse flip angle. So the illustration on the left here is our equilibrium state where the net magnetization is aligned with B0 with the z-axis and then the net effect of adding in some RF uh, magnetic field and it's uh, at the Larmor frequency is we're going to tip it or deflect it away from the Z axis by some angle. And we're going to use this concept of the RF flip angle uh, over and over in, in the course. Uh, we can also look at that. This is just showing this in another way. So I'm not draw, uh, taking that drawing of all the individual spins, but rather looking at our net magnetization uh, vector here, <clears throat> uh, initially pointed along the z-axis. Now I will apply a short burst or a pulse of RF energy through my RF transmit coil. That's going to have the effect of tipping the net magnetization away from the z-axis by some angle, what we call the RF pulse uh, flip angle. And after this point is when we're actually going to be able to see precession and get some signal. So um, putting a lot of this together, I'm going to show this uh, animation again uh, here um, and add a few more specifics. So we refer to the magnetic field generated by our RF coils as the B1 field. So B0 recalls our main magnetic field. B1 is our RF magnetic field. Uh, and this is applied in a direction perpendicularly to uh, B0. So that's what's shown initially in this animation here is the, the magnetic field created by the RF, represented by this yellow B1 vector, 
it's pointed and will remain pointed through the animation when I get it going in the XY plane. Whereas if we're showing the, um, the main magnetic field B0, the call is aligned by convention along the Z axis. And then one of the tricks we have to play here is that we do have to apply uh, this, uh, we have to create this resonance condition between our RF uh, pulse and our um, these, the precession frequency of our net magnetization. And so now I'm gonna start up this movie and what we're gonna see is that the B1, the RF field is, is rotating at the same rate that the net magnetization M will be rotating as well. So you can see as soon as the net magnetization gets tipped away from the Z axis, it's rotating here at the Larmor frequency. And to tip it further and further, we simply um, continue to apply the uh, B1 uh, magnetic field, the RF pulse uh, at that same frequency. Uh, this is the core of the resonance phenomenon is that we put our RF uh, pulse in resonance or in sync with the uh, rotation frequency of the net magnetization here. Another point I want to make here, why is this called RF pulses? That's because we apply RF in short duration or bursts, usually on the order of one to 10 milliseconds. So we refer to this as a pulse. And when we begin to draw some pulse sequence diagrams, which represent the way that we acquired uh, perform MRI experiments. Uh, we'll show that at pulse form there. Um, and then again, as you've seen by when we meet all these conditions, so magnetic field applied perpendicularly to B0, uh, applied at the right frequency, and we just apply it in some short burst here, we can cause the net magnetization to be become uh, tipped away from the Z or B0 axis. Now, um, this concept of resonance equitation, I, uh, I think can be a little bit um, tough to, to grasp, um, but uh, uh, there's a good, um, and, and the, basically the, the key point here is that we, we do need to apply the RF at the resonance frequency to the magnetization, have this resonance phenomenon. Why do we need to do it specifically at this resonance frequency? Um, what I'll go through in class is this compass uh, example here, um, and there's a nice uh, complete sort of description and demo of that here. Uh, briefly, I'll give a, a physical example of, of when you're pushing, when you're sitting on a swing and trying to get a swing to go higher. You have a very specific rate at which you're going to want to, you know, if you remember back to your youth or, you, uh, you know, um, pre-pandemic, you can go buy a swing set and see some kids. And of course, and you recall, you got to move your legs right in the right rhythm to get the, the swing to go higher and higher. And that's basically what we're doing with the RF pulse. If we move the RF pulse in the right rhythm related to the, the frequency of the net magnetization, we can get the net magnetization to go farther and farther from equilibrium. So in the swing example, equilibrium is it's the lowest energy state. That's what things return to. Equilibrium is the swings hanging down. In MRI, it's the net magnetization pointing along the z-axis. And then the resonance is we're going to, uh, in the swing example, you're going to pump your legs back and forth at the right frequency. And then you're going to you swing higher and higher. In MRI, we're going to apply our perpendicular RF field at the right frequency, and it's going to gradually tip the net magnetization, as you saw in that animation, further and further away from the z-axis. Uh, and without this resonance condition, in fact, we cannot get uh, uh, excitation of our net magnetization. We cannot get signal. So now that we've seen the RF pulse excitation, we actually have the building blocks for the basic NMR or MRI experiment, where we start off 
We've got all our, our components, our whole MRI scanner. We've loaded up our subject into the big magnetic field to create our net magnetization. So our spins preferentially aligning with the magnetic field. That in itself does not give us any sort of signal. So we need to apply the RF pulse excitation to cause the net magnetization to move away from the z-axis. We're doing it at the same rate that the magnetization is moving. So that helps it like to uh, pull it further and further away from the z-axis. And then we're gonna turn the RF pulse off and we're just gonna listen, basically. We're gonna turn on our receivers and listen. And now the net magnetization is beginning, gonna begin to uh, precess or rotate around the z-axis. It's gonna change the magnetic field around it. And this oscillating magnetic field, we can convert to an electric current in the loop of wire in this example. And this is your basic MRI experiment. Get your subject in the MRI system, apply an RF pulse excitation, and then listen, receive some signal. Okay, so we have our basic uh, MRI experiment of excitation and signal reception. Uh, and at this point, I wanna introduce the Bloch equation named for famous physicist Felix Bloch, who was one of the discoverers of the MR, uh, magnetic resonance phenomenon. And Really, this is our equation of like first principles we can derive. Basically, everything that uh, happens uh, in MRI uh, from the block equation here. And uh, today we're going to focus on this first term in the block equation, uh, which is this uh, cross product. Um, this is not something for the purposes of this course I'm going to expect you to solve, but I do want you to understand where some of these relationships are coming from and, and the intuition behind things like the rotation of the RF pulses. So uh, first some definitions of the terms in this equation. So we have uh, M is our net magnetization. This is a uh, vector um, that can change over time. Um, and the uh, M0, T1, T2 are some of the tissue MR properties that we briefly touched on, T1 and M0, the equilibrium magnetization. Uh, we'll use those more as we get into uh, determining the contrast of MRI. And then the B vector here is the magnetic field. And so you see a couple things now that we've talked about in the Z component of the magnetic field. We have B0, our main magnetic field. Uh, for completeness here, I've added an extra term, which is the uh, delta, general delta BZ term. This is changes on top of our main magnetic field. And some of this is by choice. These are the magnetic field gradients where we're changing the adding or subtracting a little bit onto the B0 field. Um, but there's also some sources of imperfection here. The main field is not perfect everywhere. That's B0 homogeneity. Magnetic susceptibility, which we talked about in the chapter two lecture, uh, then plays into this term and can cause some uh, differences and uh, chemical shift that we'll speak about later. The focus of this lecture is the other two components of this uh, magnetic field vector is the RF uh, frequency magnetic field. And notice these are in the X and Y uh, components of this vector. So they're perpen in the plane perpendicular to the main magnetic field. Okay, and uh, here I'm repeating uh, in this slide that I've mentioned I'll show many times here uh, of the different magnetic fields. Um, uh, just to have that for your reference here, I'm gonna bring out a couple of the key points from this in the next couple of slides. Okay, so the way we're going to use the block equation to describe the phenomenon of RF pulses and RF excitation is you're going to make a simplification here by neglecting the relaxation term. That was this other term initially shown over here uh, that included T1, T2, the MR relaxation times, M0, the equilibrium magnetization. Um, and that's actually a very reasonable assumption to do over the time scales of the RF 
pulses. So now this differential equation, which the left here is the change in the net magnetization over time, is equal to the current net magnetization, and x here is the cross product, so the vector cross product with the magnetic field. Um, so the short answer of what this differential equation means is that this m net magnetization vector is going to rotate around our magnetic field vector b in a left-handed fashion. And the rate of rotation is going to depend on how large our magnetic field uh, vector is. Okay, so let's go through a couple examples here. So first off, let's draw our case of equilibrium. This is, as we described before, when we first put our uh, subject into uh, the system, we're going to have our net magnetization, or uh, sorry, our magnetic field aligned with the axis, so we can write this as our magnetic field. There's no RF, there's only the main field. And at equilibrium, he said is that the net magnetization is also aligned on the Z axis. And this Bach equation says there's nothing else going on in this situation here. M can't rotate around B if they're pointing in the same direction. Okay. The other case that you've seen in the animations is precession. And this is the case where we can maintain, we still have just our magnetic field being our main field B naught along the Z axis, but, uh, and I'm gonna draw it all the way down here, say our net magnetization at some, now we need to keep track of the time because this is gonna change. So at some time zero might be aligned along the y axis, for example. And now in this case, the block equation tells us what's, what's ha what you saw in those animations is that the net magnetization here is going to rotate around the uh, magnetization. Uh, the magnetic field vector here and the rate of this uh, rotation is going to be far more frequency. Yeah, so that's what this equation was above here, gamma times the amplitude of the magnetic field or B naught in this case. Okay, now let's move on to case of well, thinking about what if we have our magnetic field vector not exactly pointing along the Z axis. So this might be the case if we have some, we've added some RF field. So our magnetic field is some um, Just say it has some x component, a y, and z. And let's say we start here our net magnetization at time zero. It's going to start on the z axis. And 
Now what the block equation said says is this net magnetization is going to rotate in a little cone here around this <clears throat> effective uh, the, the, this now net magnetic field. Um, and this is uh, extends to uh, any circumstance. Let's say we draw the we have a magnetic field that now has a y component. Start at equilibrium again, and now we're going to have no left-handed rotation, if I can draw it correctly, of the net magnetization around this effective magnetic field. Okay, so now this is the building block for how we're going to get RF excitation. It is where instead of leaving the magnetic field completely pointed along the z-axis, we're going to deflect it slightly from the z-axis. However, the trick is that this is very, very slight. So I'm just going to redraw that, but a little more accurately. That, or and not even that accurately, necessarily. Uh, so here I've expanded the magnetic field vector along of that initial case. But the challenge here is that the size of magnetic fields we can create with our RF coils here in this transverse plane, these are on the order of maybe 10 micro Tesla. Whereas our main magnetic field, say, is about one Tesla. Okay, so the two components of this vector are this massive component along z and just a teeny component along x and so what's going to happen to our net magnetization if it starts along um, the z-axis here the answer is not very much since this Magnetic field vector is basically pointed right along the z-axis. It's just going to, and this is even, the drawing here is even an exaggeration. It's going to almost imperceptibly rotate uh, away from the z-axis, but not enough to give us really appreciable signal. What we'd really like to do is what I showed in a, the example a couple slides previously, get this neck magnetization far away from the z-axis. Then it's going to create a lot of uh, signal actually in this case. And so this is a case of a, uh, a static uh, B1 field. So actually at a, uh, you know, that means the frequency is zero. And so the trick, as I've alluded to, is actually taking this magnetic field and rotating this magnetic field at the uh, characteristic Larmor frequency. So what that would look like is, um, for example, it could be uh, a, oops. So an oscillating component here, a sine and cosine, that means some rotation at this omega naught frequency. And this is where we're going to get the resonance condition. I can still start off with our M naught here uh, along 
z-axis um, and it's uh, my drawing is not going to do it justice the videos did a much better uh, job of showing this uh, but this is the case where now if the uh, frequency of the RF and the frequency of, of, of rotation of M naught around the z-axis is synced up then we're going to get this case where it can eventually rotate uh, for example M naught, we can get some appreciable flip angle. We can rotate uh, the nemancization, uh, excuse me, some uh, large amount for the uh, away from the z-axis. So this is radio radio frequency v1. Oops. So remember here we're applying this uh, and this uh, where the frequency omega naught needs to be gamma times the main magnetic field strength. So this is the case we need to, to achieve here. So now I want to introduce for the first time of many uh, in the course, uh, what's called a pulse sequence diagram. So I've got a sketch here of a set of axes. Um, and to the right here is time. And this is how we describe actually our MRI experiment. We have our RF, we have our GX, GOI, GZ. These are our gradients. We'll get to them later. Data acquisition, DAQ is data acquisition. Uh, but here we're going to focus on the RF and the pulse. So what the RF concept of an RF pulse means is we're going to go in here and we're going to draw it as this. We're turning on an RF, uh, our RF field with uh, that has going to have some amplitude. Let's call it V1 naught, and it's going to have some duration. Call that tau for now. Um, so we'll use this pulse sequence diagram format a lot, and we're going to look at how the net magnetization changes across this uh, pulse sequence diagram. Now, we're also going to use another trick here. Uh, which is called the rotating frame for looking at. So I've hopefully I've just convinced you that we need to do resonance excitation because um, of and one way of looking at it is that our RF uh, B1 field is so small with, compared to the main magnetic field that we have to keep oscillating back and forth. We have to get this resonance condition to actually get any appreciable excitation. And that's what Again, this illustration here was is that um, we're performing this resonance excitation. Get much better uh, in the animation than in my drawing, no doubt. Now that I've hopefully convinced you of that, we're actually going to not use this picture going forward because we can use a mathematical trick. So we're going to use a mathematical trick called the uh, changing our frame of reference. So that basically means instead of looking at our system as if we're in the lab, so this is sort of the real world frame where uh, things are happening at the Larmor frequency, we can imagine, well, just as the observer, we're going to rotate around the scene at the same rate as the Larmor frequency. And then it turns out when we do this, this is the picture we get of the net magnetization rotating around um, the uh, <clears throat> the magnetic uh, the RF uh, vector here 
So again, bring these two up, the lab frame, which is nice in that it illustrates that we need this concept of resonance. The rotating frame uh, makes it a lot simpler uh, to visualize what's going on with uh, an RF pulse. And look at things like flip angle, for example. Okay, so now if you look at this in the rotating frame, we're gonna, uh, in one of the, with the, uh, in the rotating frame, we can, the Nishimura textbook goes through a lot of the math uh, of this if you're interested in, but now basically we can, we, we can remove the B0 part of our magnetic field vector. Um, and, it simply become a vector along uh, the x-axis. Sometimes this is referred to as an effective magnetic field because it's in the rotating frame. And our magnetization starts at equilibrium. Again. And then our block equation says, well, the uh, the magnetization is going to rotate around the magnetic field. The block equation still holds, even with this mathematical trick going from the lab frame to the rotating frame. And if we uh, now travel some time tau later, which is the duration of the RF pulse uh, that I showed uh, before, then we're going to end up with the net magnetization uh, rotated by some angle theta, our flip angle. Um, and this flip angle theta, in the case of the RF pulse I showed, and actually derive it's equal to gyromagnetic ratio because that shows up in the block equation. The amplitude of our RF pulse and the duration. So the longer we play the RF pulse, sorry, the duration here or the higher amplitude we use for the RF pulse, the greater flip angle we're going to get. Now I want to make another a definition of terms here. So, you know, generally we have the net magnetization can be pointing in any direction. It has X, Y, Z components. Um, we're going to divide it up into what we call the longitudinal magnetization. So the longitudinal here, this is simply the Z magnetization over time. And then we're going to define the transverse magnetization to be the XY component. And this turns out to be a very, uh, convenient uh, notation because there's sort of different behaviors between being pointed along the z-axis, the same direction as the main field, versus pointing along the x or y directions. And this is defined to be the x component of the magnetization plus the y component, but placed in the imaginary uh, channel here. Um, so if we come back to this picture and visualize that, this is MZ, this is our height along MZ, and then say it's sort of pointing out some direction like this, and then we have, this would be MX, 
you know, back here, made it difficult, but this would be my, and then uh, the length, uh, and then then mxy is the uh, combination of these two here. Okay, so I want to go um, back to uh, this example where we had our RF pulse applied for some amplitude and some amount of time. And get the rotation of the net magnetization by some angle theta here. Uh, in this case, and this is the duration time tau, so we could say, I often use a notation, like this time here would be t plus, time here would be t minus, in this case, the, the longitudinal magnetization at time t plus is going to be m naught, our initial value, times the cosine of theta, and our transverse component is going to be i times m naught times the sine of theta. We have this i here because we're along the y uh, axis. And remembering this is the same example before where we're starting with an uh, equilibrium magnetization. Um, and just a brief point to make, I uh, won't go into too much more detail here, but we can actually choose the direction of this RF pulse. So I could in fact play the RF pulse such that our net magnetization be rotated into the X plane. So we could end up with Z magnetization that's the same or our longitudinal magnetization that's the same, transverse magnetization of that's similar, but it's on MX, so there's no uh, I there. And this would be accomplished by playing an RF pulse that's actually um, now along the minus Y axis, as opposed to this case, which is the RF pulse along the X axis. And so here's just a few illustrations of um, different flip angles that we will see and use in MRI. Uh, here's a case of a uh, 45 degree flip angle. Let's see, we got this 45 degree flip. Uh, they're just kind of Nice to look at here. Here's a 90 degree flip angle, or almost 90. <laughs> a little imperfection in the movie there, but uh, we're basically taken from Z all the way down into the MXY, fully in the transverse plane. And the final example here, a 180 degree flip, so rotating from the positive Z axis all the way to the negative uh, Z axis here. And these are some of our uh, various types of flip angles that we'll see in MRI for various reasons, uh, as we'll go into uh, later on in the course. Um, and here's just an overview of 
the reasons. So again, we have these smaller tip, like the 45 degree I showed, or range anywhere in this uh, um, zero to 90 degree flip angle range is considered small tip, 90 degree excitations or saturation pulses, 180 degree pulses for spin echo and inversion. And there's a, a different purposes for each of these different RF pulses, which we'll uh, be getting to, particularly in some of the image contrast uh, next couple of lectures. Uh, finally, some just practical considerations that we have with all uh, RF pulses is that there is a procedure called the RF uh, pre-scan or the RF calibration that needs to happen for every subject or different anatomical regions. Um, you need to figure out uh, what is exactly the Larmor frequency. So this can be done with some calibrations, or called, sometimes called the center frequency. Uh, you need to calibrate uh, the power. So I wrote on there, you know, a magnetic field that we want to get, but behind that is it needs to be a certain uh, power that goes comes from the RF amplifiers into the coil, a certain amount of current, for example. Uh, and then the RF uh, uh, receiver gain, so for the receive coils. Um, and when you get on the scanner, you'll see uh, this pre-scan that will uh, be calibrating all these values with some efficient routines. Okay, so the final thing I'm going to talk about in this lecture is the RF power. And we'll have to bring this up because this is important for safety considerations. So before we were looking at the, in the pulse sequence diagram, we were looking at the RF amplitude. So the amplitude, for example, of this simple pulse that I drew before was V1 naught, you know, the pulse applied for some amount of time T. Um, but the power is proportional to the amplitude squared. So generally, uh, I'll write that we can also uh, notate the RF pulses or the RF uh, waveforms as we call them as some general V1 of the function of time. So the power is proportional to the whatever the uh, RF that is being played and the square of that. And again, the reason this is important is that uh, we need to calculate the specific absorption rate or SAR, which is a power per unit time and is uh, safety limited by subject heating considerations. So briefly, this SAR is proportional <clears throat> to some time integration of the RF waveforms squared, so the power of the RF uh, waveforms integrated over some amount of time. Okay, and that is it for uh, this lecture on RF pulses. Uh, again, here are some of the uh, learning goals to um, go through and review and um, make sure that you're capturing some of these concepts of the procession, uh, a little review of where does the signal come from, and that motivates why we need to do RF excitation. Why does it need to happen at the resonance frequency? Uh, we got into the concept of flip angle, the lab versus rotating frame of reference. I'll do an example of that also uh, in class as well. And then briefly at the end, we'll cover it, right? RF pulse calibrations required. Okay, thank you very much.